Welcome back to our second session of this afternoon. Our speaker is Mark Murphy of Georgetown University. He is also visiting Notre Dame this year. And he will be speaking under the title, God Beyond Justice. Thank you. I'm grateful to the organizers, uh, grateful to the organizers for having me out. Uh, when I received the invitation, I was thinking of all sorts of different excuses not to do it, which I quickly recognized in myself as avoidance behavior. Uh, I think a lot of these have, in fact, avoided uh, these sorts of questions. Um, so take a crack at it. We'll see if, there's, see if there's anything to this. So there are many divine actions recorded in Scripture that might be used to focus one's mind on the question of God's goodness. Consider but one, the massacre of the Jerichoites by the army of the Lord. The angel of the Lord told Joshua, the Lord has given you the city and everything in it. It is under the Lord's ban. Only the, the harlot and all who are in her house are to be spared because she hid the messengers we sent. As the horns blew, the people began to shout. The wall collapsed and the people stormed the city in a frontal assault and took it. They observed the ban by putting to the sword all living creatures in the city, men and women, young and old, as well as oxen, sheep, and asses. This is, to, be, to put things mildly, a disquieting text. There are various hermeneutical maneuvers that one could employ with respect to it that would make its presence less disquieting. But I am not interested here in the plausibility of these maneuvers, either generally or in respect of this particular text. I will suppose that this text makes a set of assertions to be construed literally regarding what God commanded the army of the Lord to do and what they subsequently successfully did. And I want to know whether this story, if it were literally true, would morally discredit the being who ordered the bloodbath, and I say no. God's ordering the destruction of Jericho would not morally discredit God, okay? So um, yeah, th when I say that this is the, the assumption that I'm working under, I'm not working, I, the idea is not that, I'm, that I take this to be the correct view. I just want to you know, abstract from it for a, mo for a moment. I mean, it seems to me that there are a variety of approaches um, that theists have taken here that you've seen, um, some of them interpretive, some of them historical, some of them distinctly moral, um, and it's this last one uh, that, I, that I want to pursue. So saying no, that, uh, saying that the, uh, the uh, God's ordering the destruction of Jericho does not morally discredit God may generate a second worry. If we answer no, do we not then lose any grip that we had on the notion that God is a lover of justice and that in his dealings with us, God is perfectly just? And again, I say no. It casts no doubt either on the view that God is a lover of justice or on the conviction that all of God's dealings with us conform to the norms of justice. Okay. How is God's ordering the destruction of Jericho supposed to morally discredit God? God is supposed to be perfectly good, and any sort, any sort of moral error would discredit God. But it's plain that this ordering of the destruction of the city, the adults and the children alike, constitutes moral error, whoever performs it. So God, with respect to Jericho, got things wrong, and so God is morally discredited. I argued that we have nothing like an adequate basis for holding that God's ordering the destruction of Jericho counts as moral error. I take it that any evidence that God morally erred would appeal to God's treatment of the Jerichoites. It may also be true that God morally erred with respect to the Israelites, in the same way that an army captain morally errs with respect to those under his or her command if he or she commands them to target non-combatants. But that the captain acts wrongly with respect to those under his or her command depends on the captains acting wrongly with respect to the non-combatants, treating them as appropriate targets. Similarly, if God acts wrongly with respect to the Israelites in ordering them to destroy Jericho, this error is parasitic on the error of treating the Jerichoites as appropriate objects of destruction. So our attention will be wholly focused on God's treatment of the Jerichoites. Consider the following two claims concerning God's treatment of them. First. God acted wrongly with respect to the Jerichoites in the destruction of Jericho. Two, God wronged the Jerichoites in the destruction of Jericho. There is more than a verbal difference here. To judge that one acted wrongly with respect to someone is a different normative assessment than to judge that one wronged someone. The former concerns what Michael Thompson has usefully labeled monadic normativity, the latter bipolar normativity. Acting wrongly in fine is a monadic property of an agent. Even if the act of fine takes some direct object X, X features, as Thompson remarks, as raw material for the wrong action. Even if the value of X is an agent, that place could equally well have been occupied by rare birds or old buildings. We can act wrongly with respect to any of those things. Wronging in fine is, by contrast, a bipolar matter for which one needs both an agent and a patient. The agent is, at least 
as, as in the case of monadic normativity, a wrongdoer, but there's also a victim, someone wronged by the action. The clearest way to see the difference between these two notions is to note that while there's a limited class of object that can be wronged, potential victims of wrongdoing, one, one can act wrongly with respect to anything that has any sort of value. One can think that to destroy a rainforest without further reason is itself to act wrongly with respect to the rainforest. All this requires is that the rainforest have value that should not be disregarded or devalued in one's deliberation and action. This value could be instrumental, but it's also possible that it be intrinsic value. The rainforest might be an intrinsically valuable entity such that it would be wrong to destroy it. Or the rainforest existing could be an intrinsically valuable state of affairs such that it would be wrong pro tanto to act so this state of affairs no longer obtains. This could be true of art objects as well. They might be valuable, in instrumentally or even intrinsically, such that one would act wrongly with respect to them in destroying or defacing them. But the Amazon rainforest and Picasso's Guernica are not possibly, possibly victims of wrongdoing. They are not parties who can be wronged. Indeed, on most plausible conceptions of wronging, it is obvious that one can act wrongly with respect to someone who is not thereby wronged by one's action. This is the category of self-regarding immorality. Justice, on the classical conception, is always toward another. So one cannot wrong oneself, though one can act wrongly with respect to oneself by eating too much, drinking too much, goofing off too much, reading too much philosophy, uh, and so forth. Okay, skip the, next, skip the next paragraph. I've suggested that the truth of one, that God acted wrongly with respect to the Jerichoites, does not entail the truth of two, that God wronged the Jerichoites. But while there are respectable and powerful arguments to the contrary, I will take the truth of two to non-trivially entail one. By non-trivially, I mean that it's not just that we will not count as a case of wronging X any case in which one does not act wrongly with respect to X. That was John Stuart Mill's uh, view. He writes that in those cases in which we find it so important to utility to override the normal rights we ascribe to folk, we save at least the verbal forms of the inviolability of justice by denying that justice really requires such an action. I will take it that X wrongs Y is a verdictive on X's action, that it condemns the action as defective. Again, as Thompson puts it, hedging a bit, the consideration that is of injustice or wronging operates pairwise between potential wrongdoer and potential victim. And the rest of the world is, to a certain extent, closed out. Okay? Um, this is what, what Joseph Raz called, uh, treats, wrong, treats wronging someone uh, is what Raz calls an exclusionary reason. Even though there are, there, are, you know, there are reasons that might ordinarily be operative, the fact that um, to, to act on those reasons would require you to wrong someone, um, so, so should, you know, that should block them from your deliberation, uh, block, them, block them from giving you good reason to, uh, to act as you, as you might otherwise act. Okay. Having made the, the relevant initial distinctions between wronging someone and acting wrongly with respect to him or her, I can now set out my central theses regarding God's treatment of the Jerichoites. If one wishes to say that these divine actions morally discredit God, then one must affirm, one, that God acted wrongly with respect to the Jerichoites. But I say there's no defensive argumentative path to one that does not require establishing two, that God wronged the Jerichoites. While I grant that establishing two would, prove, would, would suffice to prove one, two is itself implausible. Thus, we have no adequate basis for holding that God morally erred in his treatment of the Jerichoites. The only really plausible argument for the claim that God acted wrongly with respect to the Jerichoites takes the claim that God wronged the Jerichoites as a premise. Note that I am claiming not only that this is the most obvious way to argue the claim, but also that it is only the only really plausible way. Why? I mentioned that all that is essential to acting wrongly with respect to another is that one fail to properly respond to the other's value. Okay, skip to the next paragraph. Suppose we appeal then to the intrinsic value of the Jerichoites. Obviously, these are valuable beings. We might want to say that it was, to put it very crudely, wasteful, heedless of their value to treat them in the way that God treated them. But I think that even granting the notion of intrinsic value at stake here, goodness from the point of view of the universe, intrinsically to be promoted or to be respected, the claim that God's actions involved a failure adequately to respond to that value is shown to be unjustified by appeal to the sorts of considerations that skeptical theists have brought forward in responding to the problem of evil. Put briefly, the skeptical theists have argued against the claim that the existence of these worldly evils calls into question the existence of a perfectly good God by denying that we have adequate reason to believe that we are well positioned to assess whether there are goods that justify the permission of those evils. Now suppose that this is the charge of the critic who holds that the destruction of Jericho involves God in moral error, that there is such a thing as fully intrinsic value, not simply for or of humans, but simply good, that the Jerichoites are themselves intrinsically valuable beings, 
and that God acted in disregard of that value in ordering their destruction. If this is the charge, we should, following the skeptical theists, challenge the critics' warrant for affirming the third of these claims. But there's no reason to suppose that the human being's grasp of intrinsic value and the means of realizing it is sufficient to give us justified confidence that God inadequately responded to the intrinsic value of the Jerichoites. To take the most obvious point, the destruction of the Jerichoites is, so far as we know, part of or best means to an organic unity that has greater or not lesser intrinsic value than would be available by leaving Jericho more intact. 